Yeah. So basically, today uh, we are three presenters: Paul, me, Paul, me, Niraj. Uh, so today, today we would like to talk about synchronized RCU and how to uh, reduce its latency. Uh, uh, let's talk about what is RCU from a higher level point of view. So it stands for as a read copy update, but I know that it's really hard to follow still the meaning because uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a bit complex. So basically, but think about this as a synchronization mechanism inside the Linux kernel, uh, which allows you to have a concurrent ac access to your uh, shared data without any, lock uh, uh, without any locking. And uh, of course, it's a pretty, how to say, it's, uh, it's scalable, of course. So think of RCU as a something that defer your work with one work item per callback. So each callback has a function pointer and a, an, an argument. Callbacks are quit into per CPU list and they are invoked after a grace period. So it allows for us to have a fast and scalable read site critical. Uh, access to shared data. So if we have a look at overview, then we can say that synchronized RCU uh, initialize and starts uh, a new grace period. Uh, a colon context is blocked because it needs to wait until a grace period is over. And uh, depends on workload, of course, it can take time. And that time can be milliseconds, at least milliseconds. Uh, so uh, when I had a look at Linux kernel 6.9, I see approximately 500 uh, direct calls to synchronize RCU within the kernel uh, in uh, different areas, from drivers to core subsystem. And uh, of course, latency of synchronized RCU uh, strongly depends on uh, your kernel configuration, how actually you compile your, ker uh, your kernel. Because uh, from RCU point of view, we have a different uh, kernel configurations like uh, RC no CB CPU, thanks to Frederick to make it. Uh, then we have a RCU lazy stuff that can be enabled. Uh, then, uh, uh, and then I need to mention that uh, normal RCU, synchronized RCU call can be converted to uh, its expedited version. Of course, it will reduce the latency, but from the other hand, it also might affect uh, real-time workloads uh, or low-latency workloads and so on. Uh, so, uh, Queenston state concept. So, it's a part of RCU machinery, and uh, it's a state that CPU passes through, which means that uh, CPU is no longer located in read-side critical sections. And Queenston state can be reported from the different context. Uh, for example, tick context, context switch, idle loop, user code, etc. So when reader site, uh, when reader uh, leave its critical section, CPU is eligible to report a Quincy state. And uh, from RCU JP basic, so JP stands for as a grace period. So on this plot, you can see that we start from the synchronize RCU uh, call. Uh, by that time, that we see that uh, we have three pre-existing readers. Uh, once uh, those readers actually leave their critical sections, CPUs are eligible to report quiz and state. It means that we don't, uh, we don't access any shared data anymore. And after that, we can uh, finalize a grace period and uh, unblock the caller. Uh, now let's have a look at uh, bottleneck or issue of synchronized RCU, which we would like to eliminate and or improve latency. So on the right side, you see the color context. On the left side, you see JP K-Trade context. So we start from the sync call. So it means that we need to que uh, queue wake me after RCU callback. So it means that uh, we kick JP K-Trade asking for a new uh, grace period. Uh, from JP k side, it uh, does some JP initialization, 
enter into FQS loop, waiting for QS reports from all CPUs. When, when it's done, uh, we mark and propagate GP end, and the grace period is over. And uh, uh, the bottleneck and the problem is uh, execution pass of callbacks. I will show you why. So first of all, uh, we can have a lot of callbacks, billion and, and so on. And uh, of course, uh, an execution time of callback depends on several factors. And uh, first of all, it's a length of CB lists, uh, how fast we execute callbacks, previous callbacks. Um, number of times a callback invocation is paused and where in a list our callback is located. So you can see we have a billion and we can be either in the beginning, in the middle or in the end. And this is a problem. Um, uh, for example, on this uh, sys trace, I took it from our mobile devices. Uh, you can easily see that uh, in a red, red trace that wake me after CU is located uh, as a last element in the list uh, um, among 3,600 callbacks. So uh, if we summarize, uh, then we need to conclude that synchronized RCU function implementation really depends on uh, your kernel configuration. And then the behavior also depends on your, uh, how you configure your kernel. And then, as I noted before, a uh, pure CPU list can be huge. And uh, also one more example that on this trace, I took a trace. So I do, I did on my machine, I run minus RF on a big folder with small files. In parallel, uh, I did a Linux kernel com compiling. I can easily reach to around one, one billion callbacks. So in my case, it's uh, 871,000 callbacks. And then of course we have an execution pass and execution pass is a problem, as I noted before, because of time constraint, uh, how long we execute callback, then we have a reschedule points in execution pass because we would like to prevent hogging of CPU, and then we have a batch threshold, how much we allow to execute callbacks. And then the last one is uh, where in the list uh, our callback is located. If we look at new approach, so it means that, of course, we would like to decouple that callback from the regular callbacks because uh, uh, our callback is a little, bit, a little bit special because it requires uh, waiting. It's, blo it's blockable. So it means that we need to, when we talk about new approach, it means that we need to bypass CB lists. It implies that we also have to maintain a separate track of sync callers only. So. Also, in order to do some micro-optimization, we can do some limit uh, direct wake-ups from the, from the JP uh, K-thread directly. And the rest can be deferred to dedicated worker to final flush. Um, also, one is important aspect that uh, we would like to unify the call. Uh, so the behavior doesn't depend on your con con uh, kernel configuration. Because um, <coughs> currently our callbacks can be uh, executed from the software review context, one pass, and second pass is uh, k thread context. In new approach, we would like to unify it. Yeah, and also it can be enabled and disabled in one time. So, if we go a little bit deeper to uh, implementation details, so of course we would like to make it uh, simple in the beginning, and probably later we can extend it. So as a result, we end up with a single lockless list. So it's used for uh, handling uh, sync users only. So uh, nodes are inquired into that list simultaneously, simultaneously from different CPUs. And uh, at every JP init, uh, we add a new wait node. And uh, the idea is that we would like to add in users and process them at the same time. And uh, within the list, uh, we maintain, maintain two tail pointers. 
it's a weight tail and down tail pointers. W uh, weight tail pointers, uh, it actually tracks or tracks nodes we, for which a current grace period is uh, is requested, and uh, we need to wait a current current grace period. And for down tail, uh, with, uh, it tracks set of nodes for which a JP is is over, and we are eligible to flush them in any time. State machine, so new rush. So as Vlad mentioned, uh, we need to somehow unblock the synchronous RCU callers, and we maintain a separate uh, list for it, the lockless list. And uh, now, how is this list maintained, and what is the state machine of it? So whenever a user or a uh, driver does a synchronous RCU call, there is a callback which is enqueued into this list and uh, that is like an atomic addition and uh, then let's say we have two callbacks which are enqueued by two users and uh, now the grace period is started and uh, the grace period k thread actually enqueues a wait head and which marks the end of our set of callbacks which will be actually woken up or which will be serviced by the new grace period and any callback which is enqueued after this point, they will be serviced by the, not the current one, but the grace period which is next to it, which is after it. Now, once the callbacks are marked, uh, on GP grace period completion, what happens is uh, the wait, the done tail is pointed to the wait tail. So that means all the callbacks which are marked by the done tail, they will, they can be, they have gone through a grace period and uh, they can be now serviced and uh, the users can be woken up. Yeah, so and uh, from this point onwards, for the next grace period, any callback which is added, they, they, they are uh, marked with a new wait tail. And, and then the next grace, grace period actually serves those uh, callbacks. So basically we have a set of callbacks which, which have been completed or which have gone through a grace period and uh, we have a set of callbacks which, which will be serviced by the once the current grace period expires. Then when the second grace period completes, uh, uh, the done tail is moved to the new wait tail. And uh, now it depends actually. So we, once the done tail has been moved to a set of callbacks, these callbacks either will be serviced from the grace period K thread or they will be deferred to a K worker. And based on when the K worker picks up these work items, either the wait tail will be updated there at that point or, and the callbacks will be serviced before the next grace period starts or if the K worker hasn't executed, uh, all the callbacks will be picked by the next K worker execution. So it will just scan the done tail and whatever callbacks are enqueued at that point uh, after done tail, they, they will be processed within that iteration of K worker execution. Now, once the callbacks are executed, uh, the done tail points to a wait head which, which points to empty callbacks. So there are no callbacks which uh, are waiting for a grace period or which, which are blocked on synchronous RCU. Now, the wait head which we had uh, in the last iteration, that is not uh, reclaimed in that particular iteration when the K worker runs. So, the point is that uh, we want to have a tail and uh, any callbacks which are enqueued uh, are actually after that tail so that uh, the k worker and the uh, and the callers can actually concurrently update the lockless list and only when the next grace period starts the wait head which which was previously there that that is uh, removed from the uh, list yeah yeah. yeah, thank you, Nirosh. And now let's talk about practical example. So I took uh, one practical example to see how actually uh, reducing of latency can improve some workloads. I used uh, uh, Android phones to do that, so I will show you later. So, uh, but let's have a, have a look. So we know that one user of synchronized RCU is a per CPU read write semaphore. And well, we also know that uh, C group is a user of such semaphore, and uh, that semaphore, in case of C group, is used to when we, when we migrate a process uh, 
with all with all its threat to from one C group to another C group. And the idea is that we, we don't want to end up with a situation when uh, uh, some set of threats end up in all C groups and other in a, C, uh, in, in a new C group. So, and uh, as noted before, Android is a use of C group and uh, we use it in order to classify uh, tasks to different from this different aspect point of view. So we have top applications, we have foreground application, we have system background applications and so on. And uh, this is done uh, because we would like to, of course, improve performance and uh, of course we would like to save power. I will show you later how we do that. And uh, on this plot, on it's a practical example, we continue. On this plot, you can see that we have three C groups, background, foreground, top up. And you see that background uh, is bind to little, little CPU or small CPUs or power efficient CPU. And then we have a big CPUs which are bind to foreground group. And then last one, we have a, a performance CPU, which is bind to top application. And uh, in case of Android phones, when you when user inter interact with the iPhone, with sorry Android, not iPhone, um, uh, so uh, applications are moved between such groups, and it's based on either application is visible, for example, if it's visible, it goes to, it goes to top application uh, or foreground group. If it's not visible, then it goes to background, and uh, it helps us to achieve two main points to reduce application launch latency, especially when we have a high background noise. And uh, of course, we'd like to save power. So it's a trade-off. And uh, uh, here you can see power versus, pe or power versus performance. So this plot is a real data from our hardware. So we have uh, uh, three CPUs, for example. Uh, green one, it's a small CPU. And then we have a red one, it's a big CPU, and then we have a, a blue one, it's a performance CPU. And uh, actually these graphs uh, represent CPU efficiency of different OPP levels. If we have a look at a uh, green plot or curve, you can see that a small CPU uh, consumes around 380 milliamp on its maximum OPP level. And uh, from the other hand, it doesn't, well, it gives you around 800 performance value. It's just a value. Uh, from the other hand, if you have a look at performance CPU, you can see that on its uh, maximum OVP level, it gives you four times faster performance, but at the same time, it might consume up to one amp. So that's why it's really important to uh, move tasks between uh, such CPU in order to be efficient from power and performance point of view. And uh, I also need to mention that uh, uh, moving tasks between, between C groups uh, happens quite often. And uh, yeah, let's have a look at uh, one practical example. So it's a camera application launch time. Uh, it's really a sensitive, sensitive use case. Uh, for all vendors, I guess, um, because it's a critical how fast your camera starts. So we have a 50, iter I took 50 iteration. Uh, on a Y axis, you can see that we have time in milliseconds. On X, is, uh, on X axis, we have a number of iteration. So we have a blue and red. Blue is a default. Uh, uh, red is a patched version where we try to reduce the latency. Uh, all data are sorted in ascending order, and uh, uh, we can conclude that we we are better approximately 17% in average. It's not average, it's media. So if we have a, if we have a look at the latency distribution histogram, uh, it's the same test case. Uh, for the new approach, we need around 8 to 17 milliseconds. So it's a waiting latency. And uh, for default configuration, we need 15 to 24 milliseconds. And also, uh, 
please know that because such latency actually influence on a uh, on a case uh, how fast your big uh, task end up on a big CPU or uh, performance CPU, how fast it actually gets migrated. Uh, because uh, I oh, I need to I, I need to mention that. Um, in C groups that we have this read write semaphore, when we take it for uh, writing, it means that uh, fork pass and exit pass are blocked because they both use uh, read lock. So let's, yeah, next steps. So actually it was more 10.6.10. And uh, since, uh, since the work is not done yet, so we, uh, we will be moving forward and uh, we have some ideas. And uh, for example, we would like to uh, to make it more scalable if it's needed. For example, to make it pure CPU or pure RC node. Uh, yeah, then we would like to process uh, our users in a FIFO order because now it's done vice versa. And uh, yeah, please use it. And we need to have some runtime because uh, you need to enable it. By default, it's disabled because uh, we would like to get some runtime first. Yeah, thank you for attention. Okay, so our question over here. Hello, uh, my question is, was a camera app example with background um, load or just, just your changes without any load? In uh, it's uh, up lunch time, it's a time taken in milliseconds. How much time you need to run your kind of application? Yeah, I, I'm wondering if there, is there, is there a back, background, background load on the uh, phone or is this improvement from your changes alone? Uh, it's actually improvement, 70% improvement if I understand your question correctly. Other questions? Yes, over there. Uh, I have also a question to this uh, result. Uh, I noticed that uh, it, the latency goes, uh, it increases monotonically. Is it because the iterations are sorted or is it somehow yeah, yeah, slowing yeah, down? Yeah, it's because of it's sorted. Okay. Yeah, it's in ascending order because uh, it's much more easier to see the difference. Because uh, uh, from one run to run uh, to another run, it's still vi vary. Yeah, so I see. Okay, yes. yeah, that's Thank why you. actually. Other questions? Yeah, uh, I have a question about the results. Also, uh, why would RCU um, uh, RCU callback handling affect uh, up launch time or camera launch time in this case, I would understand that like freeing stuff would be improved. But uh, during the launch, you probably are creating stuff, not not freeing stuff, right? Yeah, it's affected because, uh, as I noted before, uh, underlines the problem of processing of the callbacks because uh, we don't know where in a list we are located. So since we are blocked, um, we can't migrate uh, our, for example, top applications like camera to bigger CPU in time. Of course we can, but it depends on what, what you mean in time. But when we optimize this execution pass, pass we see that uh, since we, uh, we are blocked, but in a less time, for less time, then of course we see mm -hmm. such improvements. Yeah, the per CPU read-write semaphore, the writer actually waits for a synchronous RCU place period before it uh, makes its presence visible to all the readers which are currently there. So that uh, wait time would be reduced for the writer thread itself. Right. Any other questions? Yep. Would um, having two different lists for the RCU callback, like an urgent one and a regular one for the freeing stuff, which is not latency sensitive, uh, would solve the issue or not? That, that's a possibility. Uh, one thing we have to be careful of is that RCU barrier assumes the lists are sorted. 
Now, it could be that RCU barrier doesn't need to wait for the synchronized RCU callbacks, but we recently got in trouble with uh, it not waiting on the K-free RC callbacks. So um, there's, there's other strategies as well. One could imagine um, having it uh, uh, take a look at the length of the callback list, and if the callback list is too long, he's expedited instead. All that might not make the real-time guys all that happy. So there's a lot of ways of doing it. This is a good starting point. Does that make sense? And if you have other ideas, please let us know. <laughs> oh, he wants one later. Oh, sure. Uh, my question is: uh, You're talking about reducing latency of synchronized RCU, but. Uh, maybe I didn't understand that part correctly, but uh, you are actually creating more callbacks, right? Uh, more often callbacks, or did I, did I get that wrong? Moving callbacks. Think. Things that used to be callbacks are now weak queue entries. Thanks. Uh, so, I am no expert of RCU, but my understanding so far has been that it only can work somewhat performantly if the number of users is not too large. Is that correct? And if it's correct, could it happen that we reach the point where we have to switch to other logs if the number of users gets too large? Um, the answer is always, is it depends. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, for example, if your users are readers, that's essentially free. I mean, it is free currently on uh, server class builds, which, of course, most smartphones aren't, but still it's close. Um, if, you have, if you have huge numbers of users, okay, I mean, huge numbers of updates, um, updates with RCU are more expensive than updates, say, with a reference count. All right, and the reason is, is because you have to wait for the readers to get done, and that waiting and bookkeeping and so on takes effort. RCU, however, does a bunch of things to reduce that cost. So, for example, if you have a huge system and you got, uh, I mean, you can have, a, if you've got 1,000 CPUs, and, and I've gotten bug reports from 4,096 CPU systems in the past, okay, if you have 1,000 CPUs, you could easily have uh, a million current, you know, a million synchronized RCUs waiting for a grace period. No problem, right? But what happens is you're not going to have a million grace periods. What it does is it does one grace period for all the ones that arrive, at, uh, arrive when it starts the grace period, and the ones that show up between that get one more grace period. So it works hard to amortize the overhead of a lot of users onto a single thing. But yes, if you, if you, you can end up with something where you're doing mostly updates and not many reads, and there you might be better off with some other synchronization mechanism. That's why we have so many in the kernel, right? Did that answer the question? It does, yeah. Okay. Questions? All right. Uh, if there aren't any more questions, uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Great talk. Yeah.